Okay. So, yeah. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, so, my name is uh, Hari Shankar. I'm a PhD scholar uh, from the Department of Chemical Engineering, IIT Madras. Uh, so, uh, first of all, uh, so can someone uh, confirm whether I'm audible or not? Okay. Yeah, so as I uh, mentioned, uh, I'm Harishankar, a PhD scholar uh, from IIT Madras. So I, I'll be handling uh, this uh, online session for technologies for clean and renewable energy production, an NPTEL course uh, by Professor Prasenjit Mandal uh, from IIT Roorkee. So what uh, I'm planning for this session is basically, uh, it's like a doubt clearing session, I would say. So again, uh, one thing I want to uh, emphasize is that this is uh, not uh, like a replacement to the NPTEL course. This is uh, just uh, a supplement to the NPTEL course. So basically, you should be, uh, you know, treating this course as a supplement to the NPTEL lectures that Professor uh, uh, Prasenjit Mandal uh, is taking. So, yeah. So basically what I'll be uh, doing for the first few classes uh, would be to just rush through uh, the videos and PPTs of uh, the uh, original NPTEL uh, lecture by Professor Mandel. And in between, uh, we'll be solving a few questions from previous year assignments as well. So uh, what I hope to achieve uh, from this uh, session is, you know, to give you some example questions, uh, examples of uh, what all were uh, asked for uh, last year's uh, assignments and so on. And hopefully that should help you, uh, you know, with solving this year's assignment questions as well as uh, hopefully it provides you something for your uh, exams as well. So that is uh, what my plan is for uh, this uh, session uh, right now. So before uh, I move on, can you guys just uh, introduce yourself, like just what you are doing, um, whether you are uh, doing an undergrad course or a B.Tech uh, or a post-graduation MS, M.Tech or uh, are you working? Just, uh, you know, can someone volunteer and explain, uh, I mean, introduce yourself basically just to get to know each other. Um, anyone else? Uh, Rajveer, Subham, Vraj. Okay, uh, which uh, year uh, are you currently in Shubham? Third year. And uh, Haridarshan, uh, what about uh, you? Right. Okay, uh, so predominantly this looks like a chemical engineering uh, group only. So I guess that is fine. Okay, um, we can start with the uh, like session today, I guess. So there are only uh, three people now, I think. And yeah, you can uh, mute uh, yourself now, uh, Shivam. Yeah, thanks. Okay, um, just a second. Yeah, so I hope my uh, screen is uh, visible to you guys. Okay. So as I said, uh, what I'll be doing uh, today is basically just uh, rush through the uh, lectures of uh, the first week, uh, the lectures that is uploaded in the NPTEL website taken by uh, Professor uh, Mandel. 
and so i'll be just uh, rushing through these uh, concepts like not spend uh, huge amounts of uh, times in these uh, concepts just exp- uh, just uh, going through or brushing through these uh, concepts i would say because uh, as i said uh, this uh, session is basically uh, just above one one or one one and a half hour maximum so this is just supposed to be uh, like a supplement to the npt lectures that you watch online so yeah so anyways uh, you guys uh, uh, must be hearing this a lot that we uh, you know energy uh, is something that every uh, country is uh, having a huge demand of and every country is looking for a new and new ways of generating energy you know nowadays uh, the uh, few important uh, topics uh, in research itself uh, could be something like a bioenergy uh, or you know waste to energy concept or uh, nowadays uh, it's uh, the batteries fuel cell batteries electric electric uh, vehicles and so on so basically all these uh, you know news pieces uh, should give you a brief idea of how important energy is uh, for a civilization or a country so like energy is the currency of uh, civilization and if you look at the uh, worldwide energy scenario of uh, a graph between gdp per uh, capita and uh, kilowatt of energy per uh, capita we can see that all these developed countries per se like you know usa canada uh, japan and australia uk all these uh, you know developed countries uh, are uh, you know way ahead in this chart compared to you know uh, the third world country i would say uh, which includes something like argentina brazil and uh, these kinds of uh, southeast asian countries and so on so india also stands in the lower uh, bit of uh, this graph so basically this graph is just a representation of how uh, you know a country which can produce more amount of energy will also improve uh, in its uh, gdp uh, per capita as well so this is just a graph that shows uh, that information and you know energy uh, is strongly related to environmental pollution and also uh, the gdp and energy efficiency are indicators of uh, sustainability so gdp uh, is something that uh, you must have he- uh, heard and uh, learned about uh, a lot of time so gdp is just the monetary value of uh, finished goods and services produced within the country on annual basis so basically gdp is just a representative of how uh, a country is developing and it takes into account all the uh, you know goods and services which uh, produce monetary value within a country so energy and energy generation has a very strong relation with uh, gdp uh, so yeah and this is just uh, up another uh, graph showing the energy scenario of uh, non oecd uh, countries basically so if you can see from 1990 so right now we are in the 2020s uh, in between 2020 and 2030 the energy requirement is actually just going up in a very rapid manner and asia especially india and china are uh, the four uh, are in the forefront of this uh, energy requirement or energy consumption uh, in asia so this should also give an idea of how important uh, finding uh, new uh, technologies to generate energy at a much more efficient manner as well as a cheaper manner uh, is important uh, for the country so in india in the total energy generation um uh, amounts to somewhere around 326 uh okay this is 3 lakh 26832.53 megawatts basically somewhere around 326.8 gigawatts of energy uh, that is being generated uh, in india and of this uh, you know more than half of this energy generation comes from coal uh, you know in uh, thermal power plants and so on and Uh, somewhere around 13 to 14 percent comes from hydroelectric uh, power plants, and gas amounts to somewhere around 7 to 8 uh, percent. And very small amount of uh, this pie chart goes to nuclear energy and diesel. And then 17.5 uh, percent comes to renewable energies. 
and this renewable energy consists of uh, mainly wind energy solar energy uh, biopower and small scale uh, hydropower and also very very minute percent of this which is uh, approximately 0.03% goes to uh, you know this new concept of converting waste to generate uh, energy so this is how uh, the scenario of energy generation in india looks like so the major um, the uh, major source of energy uh, as shown in this uh, pie graph you can say it, it is from petroleum sources or uh, coal so uh, so getting energy from these petroleum and coal sources obviously leads to a lot of uh, emissions mainly carbon dioxide emissions so if you see this uh, graph here there is like a very slight but linear increase in the uh, atmospheric carbon dioxide levels so in june 15 it was uh, 2015 it was 402 and by june 2017 it went up to 408 so slowly slowly this atmospheric carbon dioxide uh, is increasing because uh, we are uh, utilizing the petroleum and coal uh, as for our energy sources uh, way too much and as uh, you already know carbon dioxide is also a greenhouse uh, gas so that is also there and Okay, uh, so yeah, the fossil fuels, our uh, carbon dioxide uh, emissions are increasing. Nitric, uh, nitric oxide. Nit So these are also increasing. Harvesting uh, the energy from fossil fuels, there are basically two methods, uh, very broadly classified, there are two methods. Uh, have you guys heard about the So, right. So, yes, that is uh, one way of putting it. So, the real definition of a critical point is that at critical point, you know, water has three different phases, right? So, one is a liquid phase, the normal water. Then we have a solid phase, which is basically ice and a gas phase, which is basically vapor. So, at critical condition, all these three phases, you know, there will be no distinction between these phases. So, it will be in a, fa in, in a state where there is no distinction between these three phases. So, that is, um, you know, textbook definition of critical point. And critical point of water is 373 degree Celsius, just an approximate value and 22 megapascal pressure. So this is the critical point of water. So any any operation that happens at uh, operating conditions less than this uh, 373 degree Celsius and 22 megapascal, that is a subcritical operation. And anything above this is supercritical operation. Right. So what this uh, tape here, yeah. degree Celsius, 373 degree Celsius. So, what this table actually wants to show is that if we try operating our uh, extraction methods at supercritical conditions, there is actually a reduction in the emissions. So, CO2 getting reduced from 926 to 835 and there is a small amount of reduction in the NOx, uh, SOx and uh, particulate matter emissions as well. So, that is what uh, this uh, table wants to convey. So, yeah, so based on this, uh, I just want to uh, go through a few assignment questions, uh, previous year assignment questions, basically. 
so just uh, go through the first question so what is or are the indicators uh, for sustainability uh, in a country any guesses yes it is uh, both energy efficiency as well as uh, gdp so what is uh, the installed capacity for electricity production in india as on uh, 31 march 2017 was yes so it is uh, 326 gigawatts so basically uh, just from these questions you can guess uh, most of i think the current assignment uh, uh, pattern also follows uh, this kind of questions so mostly the questions are theoretical in nature and maybe uh, one or two uh, numerical problems uh, per uh, assignment i feel but most of these questions are pretty uh, straightforward from what you learn in the uh, lectures so that's what I, I was able to understand uh, from the previous year questions as well as uh, the uh, current year uh, questions okay so what uh, the global carbon dioxide or atmospheric carbon dioxide level reported in june 2017 was okay uh, close but uh, it is actually option c Okay, even I was wrong. It's option D. My bad. Um, okay, more people are joining in. Okay. Fine. Okay, uh, so yeah, this is uh, just from the uh, previous table that uh, we just saw. So just uh, match the following with the correct values. Uh, I think I should be able to remember uh, this pretty easily. Um, any guess? Okay, so anyways, um, the carbon dioxide was uh, 926 at subcritical uh, condition and it went all the way up to, uh, you know, it decreased to 835 at supercritical. NOx was, uh, you know, 2.22 at subcritical and it reduced to 2 at supercritical. Uh, sulfur oxide emissions were 6.82, reduced to 6.16 and particulate matter was uh, 0.17, reduced to 0.15. So the correct option here is 1 A E. So any option that gives uh, there is these two and then the uh, second one is uh, B and F. So both of these are giving that also. The third, uh, third one is uh, C and G and only uh, option 1 is giving that. So the correct option here is option A. Yeah. This one A, E, B, F, C, G and D, H. Okay. Let's uh, move on. So, there are a few uh, methods by which we can extract or, uh, you know, harvest energy from fossil fuels. So, there is the combustion, uh, the combustion route, or which is uh, also known as the convenient, conventional route, and this is uh, one of the most followed methods, I would say. And this usually has, uh, you know, higher emissions as well as, uh, you know, very negative environmental uh, impacts like pollution and uh, greenhouse uh, and so on. And the other uh, method is a slightly cleaner route of, uh, of uh, harvesting the energy. And these could uh, have two uh, different kinds of techniques. So one is uh, by modifying the existing conventional te uh, techniques. So for example, if you uh, 
clean the feedstock or let's say if you remove the nitrogen and sulfur content from your fossil fuels and then combust it you can uh, you know prevent the emissions of uh, sulfur and nitrogen oxides so that kind of a cleaning process if you do to the feedstock and follow the conventional route there is a chance that you can reduce uh, the amount of emissions that you are producing so that uh, is the feedstock cleaning method then uh, you know process design and modification for example whatever emissions you are uh, emitting you can uh, collect it and uh, process it before uh, emitting it to, it to the uh, environment uh, that actually comes uh, with the uh, treatment systems and uh, process and uh, modification uh, part yeah, uh, it's, it's uh, yeah heavy crude processing so for example uh, i don't know if you have uh, an idea of the uh, refinery process so in refineries once you distill uh, the crude oil you usually get a, a fraction called heavy heavy fraction which uh, usually consists of heavy oil and residue so a few decades back we used to just discard this heavy oil and residue nowadays uh, what uh, the refineries are doing is they are uh, re uh, recollecting this heavy oil back and they use catalyst to further crack down so you must have heard something like a fluid catalytic cracking desulfurization process and so on so just to name a few so you can process this heavy uh, fuels and make more uh, valuable uh, you know products and thus prevent uh, discarding of these heavy oil fractions so that is a uh, uh, one example of this process and design modification and then uh, there is the other uh, method which is uh, moving forward to newer techniques something like a gasification process oxy fuel combustion chemical looping direct liquefaction whisk breaking and delayed coking solvent deasphalting and reforming processes so these are just uh, the names of a few newer techniques that uh, can be followed that has uh, that is considered uh, to be a more uh, cleaner uh, route compared to the conventional routes of energy harvesting and when it comes to renewable uh, energy production mainly you can, you have this solar energy hydro energy you know from hydro electric power plants biomass uh, to waste energy so biomass uh, itself so uh, these processes are usually uh, you know thermochemical or it could be uh, biological so thermochemical so you must have heard uh, some processes called pyrolysis um so something like pyrolysis yes yes exactly so pyrolysis even gasification so these uh, uh, this comes under uh, thermochemical process and thermochemical basically means thermal means heat and chemical means you know uh, chemical uh, what uh, this process does is you use heat to induce chemical changes so that is basically what thermochemical process mean and then biological process uh, you know you could say something like fermentation so you can even term this as biochemical i would say so these are just uh, uh, some uh, biomass and waste to energy processes to name a few and there is even a new uh, technique uh, called as in thermochemical uh, process called as hydrothermal processing these are just a few uh, names of the processes uh, that uh, goes under this uh, biomass and waste to energy uh, thing and then you have uh, the tidal and wave energy uh, wind energy and uh, geothermal energy just to name a few sources of uh, renewable energy production so in the uh, first week uh, we will we'll mostly be focusing on coal and uh, you know how we can harvest energy from coal the composition of coal and so on so mainly we'll be focusing on coal for uh, the first uh, lecture so coal uh, you uh, anyone want to uh, you know just say explain what uh, coal is how coal is formed
Um, any volunteers? Yeah, basically uh, that is uh, what coal is. So, uh, you know, biomass basically plants and animal remains gets buried under the earth's surface uh, for millions of years. And, uh, you know, after uh, the action of heat and pressure, these uh, remains would get converted into what's known as coal. So coal, uh, it is a combustible black or brownish black sedimentary rock normally occurring in rock strata in layers called coal beds or coal seams. And it is uh, primarily composed of carbon with variable quantities of hydrogen, sulfur, oxygen, and nitrogen. So C, H, N, S, and O. And also it will have some inorganics as well, which we usually term it as ash. So the geochemical process that transforms plant material into coal is called coalification or is often expressed in uh, this following uh, flowchart. So peat is basically uh, like what is uh, you can, what you can call the plant and animal remains. Yeah. So peat will form lignite, and then uh, the bituminous uh, coal and the anthracite coal. So basically, if you want to look at the order of quality. Anthracite is the highest quality coal followed by bituminous and then lignite and peat. So anthracite, anthracite is uh, the coal that has the highest quality of the birds. So this is just a table that shows uh, the elemental composition and uh, the calorific value of these uh, coals. So as you can see, the lignite coal or even peat, they usually have a very low carbon content varying from 25 to 35 and a very high oxygen content varying from 20 to 30 percent and because of this uh, also they even have uh, 10 percent ash content and because of this high oxygen content your calorific value will be usually less than uh, you know 20 thousand kilojoule per kilogram or uh, 20 less than 20 megajoules per kilogram so 1000 uh, a thousand kilojoule is basically a megajoule so yeah and then you go to the subbituminous and bituminous range these are slightly better uh, coals having a slightly higher uh, carbon uh, value and slightly lower oxygen content which subsequently uh, it it can have you know energy up to 35000 kilojoules per kilogram and then you go to anthracite and uh, which uh, I earlier uh, I mentioned that it is the mo uh, highest uh, quality coal that you can find. So this anthracite will usually have like uh, the majority as carbon and a very minute amount of oxygen and it usually has about 35,000 kilogram per kilojoule calorific value. So one important point here to note is this that Indian coals are mainly bituminous, lignite and uh, as a, has a very high ash content. So it is very rare to find anthracite uh, coals here in India. Mostly it is uh, bituminous or subbituminous or in the lignite uh, kind of uh, coal. And if we look at the state wise uh, deposits of coal, we can see Jharkhand and Odisha having more than half of our uh, country's coal reserve, followed by the other states. And the current rate of coal that we are consuming, it is estimated that our country has enough coal for the next 600 years. So, yes. So, India has a total of 301.5 billion tons of coal reserves and most of these coal reserves are non-coking coals and coke, coking coals or cokes are solid carbonaceous material derived from destructive distillation of low ash, low sulfur bituminous coal. 
so i will be uh, will be going through what coking and caking is uh, in the subsequent slides but just uh, as an information most of our uh, cold reserves are non coking in nature and these are uh, the different grades of cold that we have so steel grade these two steel grade 1 and steel grade 2 basically means these are uh, cold that is used in the steel industry and they should have an ash content of 15% but not exceeding 18% and then the other grades of coal are commonly known as washery grade ranging from washery grade 1 to washery grade 4 and these coals are usually used as fuels in thermal power plants and they the ash content in these uh, coals can be uh, much higher than the steel grade coals so these are some of the important uh, properties of coal so you have this uh, caking and coking properties heating value or calorific value moisture content of the coal volatile content fixed carbon and ash content of the uh, coal then you have the chemical or elemental composition chns uh, those kind uh, those composition and the particle size and porosity caking index swelling index and uh, petrographic analysis and uh, reflectance just uh, naming a few of the important properties Uh, that are important in deciding uh, what we can do with uh, a certain sample of coal so these properties decides the use uh, and the uh, value of the coal that we have so yeah caking versus coking so on the application of heat in the absence of air some coal swells and leaves a coherent residue this property is called caking and the coal is called caking coal so basically you know if you uh, apply heat to coal in the absence of air in it inert atmosphere most of its uh, moisture as well as uh, the uh, very low volatile content leaves the coal and it leaves something called as cake behind and that cake if it uh, if the coal has this property this process is called caking and the coal is called caking coal some caking coal residue possesses metallic grayish luster and all physical and chemical properties of coke manufactured commercially is called as coking coal a non coking or non caking coal leaves a powdery residue under the above treatment so the yeah so this this picture you can see see this uh, top picture is basically the coal and if you heat this coal under inert atmosphere you will have you will have something like a coke here so this coke is what we you generally use as fuel so this coke is what we use as fuel in our uh, you know thermal power plants and uh, electricity generation and so on so when we look at the properties of uh, coal so we learned that moisture is an important property of the coal so moisture there are different kinds of moisture uh, that we can find in coal so one is the surface uh, moisture which adheres to the outside surface of a coal sample or a particle then we have something called as inherent moisture which is an integral part of the coal seam in its natural state including water in pores but exceeding excluding that in microscopically visible fractures so um, you guys uh, have you guys learned uh, mass transfer uh, so the i think in third year i think you will start learning mass transfer where you have uh, the process called drying um, has anyone exactly yes so you you must have uh, learned about these different moisture contents in that uh, uh, you know portion so you have uh, the inherent moisture then you come down and you can have an equilibrium moisture so basically the same uh, that you can find for coal as well so you have the surface moisture you have the inherent uh, moisture you have the equilibrium moisture content and then you have the residual moisture content so this residual moisture content basically means even after uh, you know drying air drying the coal sample for uh, over a period of time 
the moisture that is still remaining in the coat. So that is uh, the uh, residual moisture content of coat. So just a just, um, few of the uh, definitions of the different kinds of moisture that you can find in a uh, cold sample. And because of this moisture content, so we usually have uh, different uh, methods of reporting the data for uh, uh, the approximate composition of uh, coal and other properties as well. So as received basis, so let's say you get a coal that has 10% uh, moisture and then the remaining 90% uh, you have something, uh, you know, the other elements, volatile, fixed carbon, ash and so on. So if you just report uh, this uh, data as such, so that uh, basis is known as as received basis. basis. Now let's say you are uh, using air and you are drying the uh, moisture out and let's say you are able to uh, dry out 5% of the moisture. Then if you uh, reduce this 5% moisture, you, your uh, residual moisture will be 5% and the remaining 95% will be this vol volatile compound fixed dash and so on. So if you report it in that basis, that is called as air dried basis. Or if you completely, uh, you know, neglect this moisture content and just want to report uh, the volatile content fixed carbon and ash without uh, mentioning the moisture content, that is called as dry basis. And if you want to mention it uh, without a moisture as well as without ash, just the volatile content and fixed carbon content that will be dry ash free basis and then uh, the final one dry mineral matter free basis uh, basically same as the dry ash free basis so if you uh, if your uh, coal sample has uh, some minerals like some metals or uh, let's say phosphorus uh, nitrates and so on so if you uh, actually nitrates come under n and o so this won't be counted, but mostly phosphorus or uh, something like a metal like calcium, potassium, just uh, giving a very vague example I, uh, right now. So if you want to uh, mention without, uh, consider, uh, without considering um, these minerals, then that basis is called as dry mineral matter free basis. So just uh, different kinds of um, methods that are a basis that you can use to, uh, you know, represent uh, your approximate composition of the coal. And then, uh, as I said, uh, caking index. So this caking index uh, gives you an idea about the caking property of the coal. So normally, the caking uh, index for coking coal should be varying from 20 to 24. And then, uh, uh, you know, for a caking coal, it should be between 13 and 24. Then you, uh, you have another property, uh, swelling index. So as I said, I'm just uh, brushing through these uh, properties because I, uh, I hope uh, you guys are uh, regularly uh, visiting the NPTEL website and uh, learning uh, these things from the uh, lectures by Professor Mandel. So that is why I'm just uh, brushing through these, uh, you know, his uh, PPTs, I would say. Because again, uh, just to uh, emphasize uh, this thing, um, this uh, class is not meant to be uh, a replacement of the NPTEL videos. This is just meant to be a supplement of uh, the NPTEL lectures. So what I actually want uh, from uh, you guys in the future classes is that you guys start asking me doubts. So based on the questions that you ask, based on your doubts that you have, I'll be able to prepare my own uh, set of uh, notes and lectures and I'll be able to cater uh, to your doubts and uh, so on. But just for the first uh, one or two classes, I'll just be using the PPT from Professor Mandel's uh, lectures and I'll just be running over uh, these uh, concepts that he teaches in his lectures. And uh, of course, uh, if you do a few um, questions, assignment questions uh, from previous year assignments. Uh, so not this year assignment. Uh, that I think you guys have to do it yourself and uh, submit it uh, for evaluation. Just uh, previous year assignments, I think uh, uh, we can uh, work on it. 
so this is just for uh, people who joined a bit late uh, just uh, letting you know yeah so yeah then the next point comes to uh, swelling index so this swelling index basically helps to test the coking property of food so caking index uh, measures the uh, or helps us uh, look at the caking property of food and swelling index helps us measure the coking property of food so swelling index can vary between 2 to 5 which is ideal for coke manufacturing so the high swelling coal is not charged for coke making as it would as it would create unnecessary pressure on the side wall of the oven and would also produce more coke porous structure and then you have the petrographic analysis and reflex, reflectance analysis which says you know the coking coal should have a minimum of 60% vitrine active constituents and a maximum of 40% inertite non non reactive constituent so this 60% should be you know c h n s o basically organic uh, in nature and 40% will usually uh, that should be the maximum of your ash content or mineral content so ash and mineral content are usually non reactive uh, in coke so even if you burn the coke the ash content will remain as such while usually this carbon hydrogen nitrogen sulfur uh, gets burnt in the presence of oxygen so that is why 60% uh, active constituents should be there that is the minimum um, per amount of uh, active constituents you should have and a maximum of 40% ash content the ideal value of reflectance will be within 1.3 to 1.5 and if uh, the coke ha develops uh, a coking property then its uh, reflectance can be between 0.9 and 1.3 and uh, reflectance is the fraction of incident electromagnetic power that is reflected at an interface so yeah so these are just uh, some of the properties uh, that we use to evaluate uh, the coal that is uh, found uh, in our country uh, or uh, worldwide for that matter so uh, even here i think i didn't go through all of these uh, um, properties just uh, giving you two or three uh, examples of these properties and then the major uh, part here is the proximate analysis so uh, proximate analysis uh, you can divide it into four parts the first is moisture which is basically the amount of water in your sample so if you heat uh, your cold for at 105 degrees celsius more people are joining okay yeah so if you heat your cold sample at 105 degrees celsius for 24 hours or uh, your you will be losing your moisture content uh, from the cold and whatever amount that you're using losing is basically water or moisture so that is the uh, moisture content uh, in the cold then you have volatile matter so volatile matter if you heat your cold sample at 950 degrees celsius in the absence of oxygen so usually this will be done in a nitrogen or an argon ambience so if you heat your sample at 950 degrees celsius without uh, uh, the presence of oxygen or the absence of oxygen all the uh, volatile components in your uh, coal will just uh, evaporate and leave your coal and whatever uh, amount that is evaporating at uh, this or volatilizing at uh, this condition that is termed as volatile matter and then ash content is the weight of residue that is left after the combustion of sample so the okay before ash content let's just uh, take a look at the fixed carbon so, so the fixed carbon how how you measure is the same process that you followed for volatile content you do you can do for fixed carbon the only difference is that instead of absence of oxygen you will be burning this sorry yeah so you will be burning the uh, uh, the coal at 950 degrees celsius in the presence of oxygen so i'll uh, i'll just uh, give you a brief uh, flowchart of how uh, this uh, approximate analysis works insert slide okay 
Okay, I'm not able to. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, in approximate analysis, so let's say you have a sample, a cold sample. First, what you do is you heat it at 105 degrees Celsius. And from this, you can find the moisture content. This is usually also done in uh, oxygen free basis or in a nitrogen or argon ambience, inert ambience. Then you heat it at 950 degrees Celsius in nitrogen ambience or argon ambience. Basically, you shouldn't have oxygen, absence of O2. So you do this, you can find the volatile matter of your cold. Then after this, you repeat the same procedure, 950 degrees Celsius, but here you heat it in the presence of oxygen. So from this, you will be able to get the fixed carbon. Uh, someone uh, raised hands. Uh, yes, uh, Jagdish. Yes, true. Uh, so this, uh, what you are saying is actually true. So uh, this uh, flowchart I am just showing uh, because uh, this is how the procedure. Uh, so uh, I don't know if you know about the uh, thermogrammetric analyzers or uh, TGA analyzers. So this is basically what the uh, procedure uh, that is followed in a thermogrammetric analyzer. So you heat it at 950 uh, to find the volatile matter and here this is not a direct measurement. Uh, what you said is actually right. So if you uh, heat it at 950 degrees Celsius uh, in the presence of oxygen, let's say you are uh, having a 10 gram of coal and after these three steps, let's say one gram of coal is remaining. So this one gram is actually ash. So in a sense, after uh, the, doing this process, whatever remains is the ash content. Right. So now, uh, as you correctly mentioned, you have the uh, amount of moisture, you have the amount of volatile and you have the amount of ash. So the fixed carbon will be 100 minus moisture minus uh, volatile matter minus ash. What you said is actually correct. So I, I just wanted to like show you uh, the procedure that is usually followed in uh, these uh, thermogrammetric analyzers. Um, yeah, so this 950 degree Celsius in presence of oxygen, you, you, you use it to find the ash, which is basically the uh, remaining compound and you, you just use the mass balance to find the fixed carbon. So I wrote fixed carbon here. Uh, it's actually not like a direct measurement. Uh, it's, you actually measure the ash content from here and then you measure the fixed carbon, uh, like as you rightly pointed out. Right. So that is about the uh, proximate analysis. And then uh, there is uh, something called as ultimate analysis, which is uh, basically you measure the amount of C, H, N, S and O, uh, carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, sulfur and oxygen. So you can measure this uh, using something called as an elemental analyzer. So in an elemental analyzer, uh, what uh, basically happens is uh, whatever carbon you have in your uh, sample will get oxidized to or combusted to CO2. The H will become water. N will become, uh, you know, NO2, which then later gets reduced to N2. 
then your s will be uh, sulfur oxide sulfur uh, uh, so2 so all these gases will be formed by the combustion of your coal and uh, whatever uh, these gases that is formed it will undergo uh, a chromatograph so this chart is basically that uh, chromatograph so you will get different peaks of these different gases and based on this intensity of these uh, n2 co2 uh, h2o and so2 the uh, elemental analyzer will uh, find the values of your n c h and s <clears throat> and the general consensus is that to find the oxygen to find the oxygen it will be 100 minus n minus c minus h minus s so this is uh, uh, just the brief uh, you know explanation of how you can find the ultimate analysis or the elemental analysis of your coal sample and uh, this table uh, again just uh, repeated uh, repeats what uh, we saw earlier the carbon content uh, you can see uh, it's only 23 percent for the lowest quality peat and it's uh, 86.5 for anthracite and you know obviously that means anthracite is the uh, better quality coal compared to peat then uh, another uh, method uh, to determine the value of your coal is the heating value or the calorific value yeah so to find this calorific value we usually use something called as bomb calorimeter so uh, we will be looking into this uh, working principle of a uh, bomb calorimeter in a, a few minutes but just before uh, moving on so you can have uh, two different kinds of uh, heating values one is the higher heating value and the other is the lower heating value so basically the difference between these two is that one takes into account your heat of vaporization of water so this is uh, basically the relationship between the higher heating value and lower heating value and you know higher heating value is equal to the sum of lower heating value plus the heat that is required for the vaporization of water so this hv is the uh, heat of vaporization of water and this n uh, represents the number of moles of water being uh, vaporized to n fuel uh, to the number of uh, moles of fuels combusted uh, if you mod if you uh, want you can even calculate this like lhv plus m dot lambda uh, in a different uh, unit uh, actually i am not going into uh, much detail but just a simplified uh, or a different version of the same formula so this m is basically uh, you know the uh, either mass or moles of uh, water that is being vaporized and this lambda is the latent heat of vaporization so this is just the relation between the higher heating value and lower heating value yeah and so this is uh, something uh, that i said uh, this is the bomb calorimeter So, uh, so how this basically works is that you know you have uh, this uh, container. So you, uh, I'll, I'll just draw you the uh, top uh, view. So you have a container like this, and inside you will keep this vessel, water bucket, basically. So this is the container, and this is the water bucket. And inside the water bucket, you will keep the bomb. This is the bomb. And in inside this bomb, so you will have a crucible. And in this crucible, you will load a known amount of your sample. So in this case, it is coal. So let's say you are uh, loading one gram of coal inside this crucible. 
and then this crucible will be connected uh, to uh, you know a variety of uh, connections uh, that uh, okay there is no close pixel right fine so you this uh, crucible will be connected to an electric connection basically so this top part here will have uh, connections uh, which uh, you know produces huge amount of uh, electric current uh, in a very short time so because of this electric current the coal that you have here will be burnt so you will provide oxygen as well inside uh, this uh, bomb so you have the vessel, uh, outer vessel here this is the uh, water uh, tank or water bucket and you will be filling this water bucket with water and then you will be inserting this bomb which contains your uh, coal 1 gram coal as well as oxygen so usually uh, what uh, procedure that we follow is that we usually pressurize uh, this uh, oxygen uh, up to 30 bars of uh, oxygen uh, inside this bomb and then we uh, immerse this bomb inside this water bucket and you know as i said uh, this will have a variety of electric uh, connections uh, from the top and when we start the process a huge amount of electricity uh, will be passed through this uh, bomb and because of that electricity your coal will immediately get combusted so whatever coal that is getting combusted combustion will uh, uh, is an exo uh, uh, will uh, release uh, some amount of heat right so heat will be generated here and this heat will be conducted to the bomb and then to the water okay so let's say initially your water uh, was at 25 uh, degree celsius then after this combustion has taken place this temperature will increase so after 30 seconds it will be 26 degrees 27 degrees like that it will keep on increasing and let's say it reaches up to uh, 35 degrees or whatever just an example so based on this increment in the temperature you can calculate the amount of energy that is being released from your coal and based on that you can calculate the calorific value of your coal so this is just the basic uh, working principle of your uh, bomb calorimeter right and yeah this is just uh, you know the different uh, terminologies and formulas that are used to calculate uh, the calorific value uh, from your uh, bomb calorimeter so basically uh, yeah this is the formula where you can find the gross heat of combustion and the gross heat of combustion is uh, delta t this is the temperature difference into w and w is the energy equivalent uh, of calorimeter in calories per degree minus e1 which is uh, a correction factor correction factor in calories for the heat of formation of nitric acid uh, e2 is the correction in calories for heat of formation of sulfuric acid and e3 is the cal cal uh, correction of uh, in calories for heat of combustion of the fuse wire so this fuse wire so the, uh, okay just a second yeah so the fuse wire is basically it will be a, a, like a thread there will be a wire that is attached to these uh, you know stocks and from these uh, this uh, fuse wire you will have a thread that goes into your uh, you know uh, coal so i am not able to show it uh, in a close uh, closed manner but basically these two connections are there to just make sure the electricity that you are passing generates enough heat that your coal is getting combusted okay um yeah so and this e1 e2 e3 are the correction factors for the formation of nitric acid that gets formed uh, from the uh, you know bomb calorimeter sulfuric acid and the fuse wire that you are using for the uh, connection so uh, again i am not going into detail uh, of how you arrived at this formula 
I hope you, you will be able to uh, look at it uh, from the uh, lectures of uh, Professor Mundell. And yeah, so this formula is the gross heat of combustion that you get from, uh, you know, uh, the uh, derivation of the bomb calorimeter. And if you rearrange this formula, you can find the calorific equivalent W, which will be equal to H into M plus E1 plus E2 by T. So where uh, W is the energy equivalent of the uh, calorimeter in calories per degree Celsius, H is the heat of combustion, M is the mass, T is the net corrected temperature rise in degree Celsius and E1, E2 are the corrections. So actually there should be uh, E2 here also, but here this uh, formula is shown based on benzoic acid. And uh, benzoic acid does not have um, sulfur. There is no sulfur in benzoic acid, right? So there is no uh, formation of sulfuric acid here and that's why uh, we are not uh, uh, considering E2 here. But uh, in a general formula, this will be the uh, formula H into M plus E1 plus E2 plus E3 by T. So yeah, these are just uh, some of the, uh, again, other uh, correlations uh, between the heat of combustion and uh, net uh, calorific values uh, in BTU per second and so on, just uh, mentioning it here. Yeah. So this is just a flowchart of how you use coal to uh, produce energy. So coal, you usually uh, crush or pulverize it in a pulverizer and then you send it to a combustion chamber where in this combustion chamber you will have coal and you will provide oxygen mostly in the form of air basically in uh, excess. So excess air will be passed through this uh, combustion chamber and combustion of your coal will happen and the flue gases will go to a turbine, gas turbine, wherein this gas turbine is connected to an alternator to produce electricity. And then this uh, gas turbine exhaust will uh, go through uh, a heat exchanger to exchange the heat uh, from the incoming uh, flow gases and then the uh, cooled flow gases are usually vented out. So this is just a brief uh, flowchart of how uh, you can produce electricity from coal. So based on the uh, processes, you have a variety of thermodynamic uh, cycles that, uh, that are involved in the uh, generation of electricity um, from coal. So one is the topping cycle, then bottoming cycle and a combined cycle. So a topping cycle, so this is, uh, I'll just uh, explain it uh, basing the, uh, based on this flowchart itself. So in a topping cycle, you pass fuel to the furnace with uh, oxygen or air, combustion will uh, happen here. Combustion will happen here and the flue gases will pass through a turbine. And from this turbine, you can connect it to an alternator and produce electric power. And then this turbine exhaust is uh, sent to a heat exchanger to exchange the heat and uh, you know the cool down uh, flue gases are vented out right so what happens here is you use the uh, flue gases from uh, the uh, furnace directly to produce electricity so that is uh, the thing of uh, topping cycle in a bottoming cycle, however, you use fuel and burn it, you pass air and uh, combust it in the furnace and this flue gases are first sent to a heat exchanger basically or a recover, this is a termed as a recovery boiler but basically this is a heat exchanger. So in uh, to this heat exchanger you pass uh, water 
which will get heated by the uh, incoming temperature of these flow gases and this water will become steam okay and these flow gases now they are cooled down and they are just vented out basically and this steam that is uh, produced from this heat exchanger is then used to run the turbine and then this turbine is connected to alternator and so on and you uh, produce electricity so in a bottoming cycle basically you use the flow gases to produce steam and this steam will give you electricity by running the turbine so that is the uh, difference between a topping cycle and bottoming cycle so in a topping cycle flow gases directly uh, give you uh, electricity and these flow gas this uh, in the bottoming cycle you first produce steam you first produce steam and then you produce electricity so that is the uh, difference between a topping cycle and a bottoming cycle and then there is a combined cycle which is basically a hybrid cycle and contains both topping and bottoming cycle right okay so performance of a coal based power plant so the overall uh, performance uh, or the energy production of a coal power plant depends on the following conditions first the heating value or the calorific value of the coal that you are using in the uh, plant then the efficiency of the thermal processing unit efficiency eta then uh, again the thermal efficiency thermal efficiency of your boiler efficiency of your turbine generator and the energy requirements of your pollution control system so whatever uh, flue gases that you are venting out you shouldn't just vent it out just like that you have to uh, spend some infrastructure to make sure it is not polluting the environment so the energy requirements and uh, you know the other infrastructure requirements of the pollution control system also plays a huge role in how uh, efficiently you can uh, function a uh, coal based uh, power plant right and any other in place energy uses so this uh, air pollution control energy use is just one example of this uh, you know in place energy uses you can uh, there may be other uh, uh, you know places where you probably have to expand energy uh, to uh, in a, in a coal based power plant so uh, you have to take into account everything and only based on that you will be able to measure the performance of a coal based power plant so the this uh, up to this point is what uh, week 1 lecture uh, was taken by professor mandal so i'll also be uh, stopping here um, this uh, lecture based explanation uh, i there are some uh questions uh, here uh, based on the uh, previous year uh, uh assignments so let's see uh, if we can solve this okay uh, so the higher heating value of bituminous coal is any uh, guesses c uh, someone said uh, c answer c let's see if it is 25 to 35 kg per kg it is so bituminous coal is uh, 25 to uh, 25 to 35000 uh, kg per uh, kg if it was anthracite it would have been uh, greater than 35000 and if it was peat or uh, lignite it would have been less than 25000 so 25000 to 30000 is the uh, calorific value range for a bituminous coal which moisture type is an integral part of the coal seam in its natural state including waters in pores but excluding that in the macroscopically visible fracture any uh, guesses
Okay, so we'll uh, go back to the uh, definitions of uh, moisture. So, again, as the uh, definitions of uh, this moisture content, you can see inherent moisture is the integral part of the cold seam in its natural state, including waters in pores, but excluding that in macroscopically visible fractures. So, in the, our current question, So in our current question, this moisture content refers to the inherent moisture content. Okay. Fine. Uh, what is true about the swelling index of cold? So we'll see uh, answer d yes so we'll see each and every uh, sentence and see whether it these are true or not so first uh, swelling index of cold helps to test the coking properties of uh, the cold that is true the ideal swelling index for a coke manufacturing is between 2 and 5 that is also true and then the uh, high swelling cold is not charged for coke making as it, it would create unnecessary pressure in the walls of the oven and that is also true. So all of these are true and so answer uh, is option D, all of these. So which one is true about the energy equivalent of a calorimeter? I think we have seen this uh, formula also. So it is W is equal to Hg into M plus E1 plus E3 divided by delta T. So this is uh, actually uh, I think this uh, question is based on the benzoic acid assumption. So I think uh, uh, they left it uh, to mention it properly. But yes. So if uh, benzoic acid uh, was taken as the basis, which one is true for the energy equivalent of the calorimeter? In that case, uh, there will be no E2. And then your option, uh, your answer will be Hg into M plus E1 plus E3 divided by 3. And then uh, the uh, final question, uh, again a very straightforward question. Which of uh, these is not a classification of thermodynamic cycle? Someone said uh, none of these. Yeah. Answer uh, is uh, none of these because all of these are uh, thermodynamic cycles. Right. Okay. Okay. So I guess uh, that's it uh, for uh, today's uh, session. So yes, um, uh, yeah. I, as I said, I, I'm just uh, rushing through these concepts and not explaining it in detail uh, because I am hoping that uh, you guys are uh, properly following these uh, lectures uh, from Professor Mandel. I'll try to uh, do the same again for uh, next week. Uh, just uh, rush through the uh, lectures that uh, Professor Mandel is uh, taking. But as I said, hopefully my uh, objective here is that you guys uh, respond well. You guys ask me questions and uh, doubts. It can be uh, you know based on concepts. It can be based on any uh, particular questions if you want not uh, this uh, year's assignment questions uh, like because uh, like these uh, assignment questions you guys are expected to uh, answer it yourself and submit uh, for evaluation 
but any uh, questions uh, in general uh, let's say the tutorials or uh, you know you have the student forum so if anyone has any questions there so you guys uh, ask me these uh, doubts and questions and based on that i'll be able to prepare my own uh, set of uh, notes and lectures and focus on those uh, particular uh, topics instead of uh, like uh, taking this whole uh, course uh, because uh, as i said uh, if i just uh, rush through these uh, concepts every week uh, I'm, i i don't know whether that will be useful for you or uh, not but anyways uh, we'll see how it goes for the first two weeks uh, again the next class also i'll try to just rush through these uh, concepts again but hopefully you guys come up with uh, these uh, questions and doubts for me and uh, hopefully we'll be able to turn this session into a proper uh, doubt clearing session right okay so i guess uh, that's it uh, for today um thank you guys for joining again uh, um my name is hari shankar um, i'm a phd scholar from iit madras and i hope to see you guys uh, next sunday same time uh, 3 o'clock and of course if you are not able to attend uh, this uh, session at uh, 3 o'clock there is one more uh, session uh, that is being conducted by one of my colleagues debarun uh, at 5 o'clock so that session will be between 5 to 7 so if in case if uh, during some uh, weeks if you are not able to attend this 3 to 5 session you can always attend uh, that 5 to 7 session or if you are uh, really interested you can attend both it's up to you guys so yes so yeah thank you thank you for joining and i'll uh, see you guys next week